Hello, I'm Dr. John Cavanaugh, and this is AJS 101, Introduction to Criminal Justice, Lesson 8, Part 1. Let's begin. This chapter is about the people who work or otherwise wind up in court and the way criminal trials are conducted. Uh, we call the people the courtroom work group. And the courtroom work group consists of the professionals who make their living in court. The work group includes judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, public defenders, and support personnel. Let's first talk about judges. Now, a judge is an, and how do you think judges get there, get the job? There's two ways. Elected or appointed public official who presides over a court of law for the purposes of issuing warrants, conducting hearings, conducting trials, sentencing the guilty, and if it's an appellate court judge, hearing appeals. Uh, whether elected or appointed, politics often enters into judicial selection. Elected judges sometimes must be politicians to get elected, while appointed judges sometimes must please politicians to be appointed by politicians. Now, some states try to limit the effects of politics by only allowing judges who have been approved by an impartial panel to be appointed to or run for judicial office. So people who want to run for office or be appointed submit their names to this impartial panel, usually made up of other lawyers or, or, or prominent people. And the panel looks at, the per at this person's background, education, uh, work history, and gives an approved or disapproved rating to them. And if they're not approved, then they can't be appointed. Or if they run for election, the voters might see that they had a low score by this scoring entity. Um, in the past, anyone could be a judge. And going back to the start of this country, to the, you know, to the days of the Wild West, there weren't that many pe college educated people, much less lawyers. So almost anyone could be a judge in those days. But today, at least above the limited jurisdiction level, almost all judges must be lawyers and also members of their state bar association. And in addition, the states also give new judges special training courses. Now, you're a lawyer if you graduate from law school, but not all lawyers who graduate from law school can go before a court and practice. In order to go before a court and practice, you have to pass a very vigorous exam administered, administered usually by the State Bar Association, which is the lawyers group, uh, which proves that you are sufficiently uh, knowledgeable of the law where you can go into court and represent people. That's called the bar exam. So you have to pass it in order to be admitted to the bar to, to actually practice in court. If you're still a lawyer and you don't pass it, you can work in an office, you can do wills and estates and things like that, but you can't go into a courtroom until you pass the bar exam. Now, judges can be impeached, and impeached means removed from office, uh, for misconduct on or off the job, maybe getting arrested or something, or for incompetence. Uh, if the judge proves to not know the law properly, uh, they can be removed. Usually the incompetence removal occurs with old judges who knew the law and were good judges, but got very old and kept running for re-election, or maybe it was a lifetime appointment, and they became senile in their old age, and they can no longer make rulings, that they fall asleep on the bench. So in those cases, they usually ask to resign, but if they don't, they can be impeached, which means removed from office. And usually the state Supreme Court uh, has a trial uh, to deal with whether to impeach a judge or not, but it could be another panel. All right, let's move on to prosecutors, sometimes called district attorneys. Now the prosecutor is an, what do you think? Elected or appointed, depends on a jurisdiction, public official, has to be licensed to practice law, who conducts the criminal prosecution on behalf of the state against the defendant. Remember, all criminal prosecutions are the state, the people of the state, or the federal government, the people of the United States, against the defendant. The prosecutor is the publicly paid prosecutor who uh, prosecutes, who represents the people in this case against the criminal or the supposed criminal. Some new lawyers become prosecutors to get trial experience so they can later go into private practice. 
Uh, if you just get out of law school, even if you pass the bar exam and you work for a private law firm, it may be a long time before you ever actually get to go in court. You become a prosecutor, you become a lawyer, pass the bar exam and get hired as a prosecutor, you'll be doing trial cases uh, almost from the, from the get-go. So it's a good place to get experience and new lawyers will often become prosecutors or defense attorneys, legal aid lawyers, to get that courtroom experience and then hop over to a private firm. But some new lawyers become prosecutors as a stepping stone to elected office. If you're a prosecutor and you're lucky enough to prosecute a really high profile case, like, like John Gotti, the, the mobster, and you win, uh, your name becomes a household word. And in politics, if your name is a household word, it's easy to get elected. Rudolph Giuliani was the, pro the federal prosecutor who successfully prosecuted the mafia, mafia uh, kingpin, John Gotti. He got so much positive publicity that he was able to run for mayor of New York City and win. So as you can see, it's a great stepping stone because in politics, name recognition is a lot. And that's why there's always campaign signs on the roads. Now, cases involving government officials or other special cases will sometimes result in the appointment of a special prosecutor to handle the matter. And special prosecutors are usually selected for their impartiality uh, and or their uh, knowledge in the specific area. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we just had uh, a special prosecutor, Mueller, investigating uh, President Trump for so-called uh, possible uh, collusion with the Russians to win the election, which he was exonerated uh, by the special prosecutor over. Uh, going back before that, uh, you had uh, a special prosecutor, a guy named Kenneth Starr, who uh, did a special prosecution against uh, President Clinton many years ago. So these are special prosecutors. They're usually not full-time prosecutors. They may have been, uh, but anyways, expertise and hopefully impartiality. Most counties and cities have prosecutors departments which employ many assistant prosecutors to help the prosecutor. And in big, in big cities with big or counties with large prosecutorial offices, you have specialty units. So there might be a sex crimes unit where the prosecutors just handle sex crimes cases. There could be a drug unit. Uh, so larger organizations, be they police or prosecutor's office, uh, have many more jobs and they often have specialty units, which makes the jobs a lot more interesting and uh, more, more choice of jobs and mobility. The prosecutors also give advice to local police departments on enforcing the law. Usually the prosecutor, uh, if the police want to know a question about, you know, can we search this person? Do we need a warrant? What does this new court decision ruling mean? They will often go to the local prosecutor who will advise them or even give them memos to keep them abreast. Uh, but very large police departments hire their own in-house attorneys. Prosecutors exercise great discretion uh, in the criminal justice system. Uh, and that discretion, is, uh, that discretion concerns uh, who they uh, prosecute, who they charge um, or indict. Uh, what do they charge them with? Uh, you know, nobody can force a prosecutor to prosecute or go to a grand jury. So if the prosecutor says, no, there's no case, um, what charge, uh, what to charge them with is another important thing. In, in many cases, the prosecutor can make a choice between a misdemeanor or a felony. Uh, in the case of larceny, the difference between misdemeanor and felony uh, has to do with the uh, value of the property in many cases. Uh, $1,500 or more is a felony, less than a misdemeanor. If, if it's not an item that was like, you know, with a price tag on it in the store, but it's like a used item, there's some discretion in what the value is, and the prosecutor can charge up or down. Or even when it's, it's known to be $2,000, the prosecutor, if he or she wants to, can still charge a uh, misdemeanor level. So that's very powerful. Um, uh, what pleas to accept? Remember, 90% of the cases are plea bargains, and uh, how generous uh, the prosecutor is with the plea uh, is, is another factor which can greatly influence the defendant. Uh, and finally, uh, what sentencing recommendations to make? If a person's found guilty at trial, usually the prosecutor was one of the parties who make sentencing recommendations to judges. So they can come in lenient or strict, depending on the case. So with all this discretion, the potential for abuse is always present. The abuse could be, you know, based on various things of prosecutor's philosophy and not personal dislike of somebody, uh, could be race. Uh, so there's a potential for abuse whenever you have discretion, which prosecutors have, uh, and power. 
And we discussed that when we spoke about police officers. Prosecutorial discretion is not controlled by outside. It is beyond the public at election time, if it's an elected prosecutor. Now, prosecutors must provide all evidence of the defense and must not advocate any position they know to be false. The rules of ethics say that a prosecutor has to give all evidence that he or she is going to use to the defense attorney. And any evidence, whether used or not, that suggests innocence must also go to the defense attorney. That's because the prosecutor is looking for a just and right outcome. And if that means giving evidence that hurts the prosecutor's case of the defense, then so be it. That is the ethical thing to do. Okay. Defense attorneys. Defense attorneys are also licensed attorneys, lawyers, who represent clients accused of breaking the law. And defense attorneys may or may not specialize in defense work. In fact, most defense attorneys do other types of law, wills, estates, you know, suing accident cases. Uh, it's very rare to have a, 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 a defense attorney who just does criminal defense because A, there's not that much money in it, and B, a lot of times your clients uh, wind up going to jail and they can't pay you anyway. Now, defense attorneys who work for the government or private nonprofit defense organizations and defend the poor, they're called public defenders. Uh, again, anytime a person is at threat of being incarcerated or executed, they have a right to an attorney. One must be provided by the state free of charge if they cannot afford an attorney. So many times the government actually hires attorneys to represent the, the poor, or maybe more commonly, they, they contract with private nonprofit organizations like the Legal Aid Society, who hires these lawyers to, to defend. But public defenders are generally underpaid and they often burn out from overwork and the ingratitude of their clients who might curse them out when, when they're found guilty. Uh, some defense attorneys are private lawyers hired by and paid by the defendant. Uh, this is probably like the best lawyer of all in that uh, he doesn't have a major caseload or she. Uh, they need to, to, to earn their, their fees from you, so they generally do a much more thorough job. And they're not generally new people out of law school, like you might get in the legal aid societies or defense, public defenders. Sometimes private attorneys are paid by and appointed by the court to represent indigent defendants. And these are called assigned counsel. And if you're indigent, you get one of them, you're lucky. Because these are regular private attorneys who, who might be pretty sharp and not overworked, who to earn some extra cash, agreed to, uh, to take indigent cases for a flat hourly rate, usually below what they would charge a private client, paid for by the state, because the state doesn't have enough public uh, defenders to defend, and they, you still have to give the person a lawyer, even if you don't have enough public defender to do it. All right, defense attorneys represent the accused at all stages in the process. Uh, if you're being going to be questioned by the police, uh, you can have an attorney and, and talk to them uh, and request that he or she be present uh, during the initial interrogation. Uh, the defense attorney ensures that the defendant's rights are not violated. All the constitutional rights, mostly in the Bill of Rights, against unlawful search and seizure, uh, these rights not to incriminate yourself. These are the rights that a defense attorney is going to protect his, his or her client uh, for. Uh, they also will... Um, counsel the defendant. Uh, the defendant needs advice on, on to plead guilty, to plead not guilty. Should I go to this hearing? Should I take this plea? You know, sh sh can I speak? Should I say this? Should I tell this? So uh, they're called counsel's lawyers because they counsel the defendant. And the defense attorney, of course, would do this. They also plan and prepare the defense. Uh, if the person is not going to accept the plea, then they have to go to trial. And you have to have a well-scripted and well-planned and researched defense uh, if you have any hope of being found not guilty. Uh, in the case where the defendant is guilty, uh, they are going to negotiate plea bargains uh, with the prosecution. In fact, some defense lawyers are just great negotiators, and people who are guilty hire them because they're known for their expertise in plea bargaining. And they also represent the guilty client at sentencing. If the trial concludes with a guilty verdict, then the defense attorney will argue for a less severe sentence at the sentencing hearing, uh, at the end of the trial. Okay, all persons accused of capital crimes, which is where you could be executed, uh, felonies, 
or any charge where incarceration is possible have a right to be represented by a lawyer. And the indigent, the poor, have a right to a free court-appointed lawyer if they cannot afford their own private lawyer. That's a U.S. Supreme Court ruling. Defense attorneys must provide their clients with a vigorous defense, but they cannot knowingly allow false evidence to be admitted. So you can vigorously defend your client, but if your client says, hey, I, you know, I did it, but if you call my friend Joe, he'll testify that I was somewhere else, he'll lie for me. Well, that defense attorney can't allow that lie to go into court. No attorney can allow false evidence to be admitted into court. That's an ethical violation. It's also a criminal act. They can go to jail. They can lose their law license. Uh, so they can't do that. So consequently, if a defense attorney's client is guilty, all they can do is what? So if you have a guilty defendant and they want to go to trial, you can't argue innocence because you know they're not innocent and that would be unethical. So all you can do is attack the prosecution's case in an attempt to create confusion in the minds of a jury. And that confusion will become reasonable doubt. Uh, however, defense attorneys do not have to reveal evidence prejudicial to their client. Remember, the prosecution has to give all evidence that uh, that, that is pertinent to the case, especially that suggests the defendant is innocent to the defense attorney. But the defense attorney does not have to reveal any evidence prejudicial to the client. The only evidence the defense attorney has to give to the prosecutor is evidence that he or she will use in court. And that's important because the prosecutor has to know in advance so they can research and, and see if the evidence is phony or not. Uh, so again, if it's a guilty client, all the defense attorney is going to do is attack the prosecution's case, attack the credibility of their witnesses, try to confuse the jury in an attempt to, to make this confusion become reasonable doubt and result in a not guilty verdict. Okay, so that's the end of Lesson 8, Part 1. And uh, after uh, you go over these notes, let's move on to Lesson 8, Part 2. I will see you there.